Hello, welcome to Lunch Money, uh, your online and social media home for special situations, workouts and capital raising professionals. My name is Nick Samios. I'm the fund manager and director here at Hermes Capital and uh, I'm your live stream Lunch Money host. Uh, so a very warm welcome to you. Um, what's going on in the world today? We, we've got arguably a battle coming up on our hands in uh, in 2021. I'm going to use that metaphor, the battle metaphor. And when you enter a battle, uh, what you need is good intelligence. You need to know who your enemy is. You need to know the lay of the land, you know, the geography, the topography, all of that sort of stuff. You need to know your own strengths and weaknesses. And so whilst we, uh, whilst from Every week, usually, we have someone who is a restructurer or a turnaround professional or an insolvency practitioner, and we very often have lawyers on the show. It's also good for us to sort of triangulate some other data from the field to understand what's going on uh, in broader terms, away from that uh, nitty-gritty of insolvency law and, and, uh, and, and the actual restructuring, but just a higher level, more broad view uh, of commerce in Australia. Um, and so today we've got two, uh, two experts. We've got Tony Sykes, who is uh, an insurance professional, and we've got Peter McAtamony, who's a wine industry professional. And you might say, well, wine industry and insurance, uh, they don't necessarily, how do those two things go together? But the wine industry uh, is, it, it's like a, a slice of life across Australian business. It, you know, wine, it's got manufacturing, it's got export, uh, it's got uh, agriculture, and of course, it's a marketing business as well. Uh, so I think that looking at the wine industry is a good way of looking across uh, across business in Australia. And the thing about insurance is that uh, insurance people are looking at risk all the time. And I always find it fascinating when I'm talking to insurance people who uh, who say to me, oh, the market is not buying that kind of risk or they're loving this kind of risk or it's really hard to get coverage in certain areas. And I think uh, that's the sort of intelligence that uh, I would like us uh, to take a look at today. Before we talk to our guests, just a reminder to uh, like this episode, press the, the like or the share button below, share it with your friends, don't keep it all to yourself. And uh, the best question of the day is going to win the lunch money mug, uh, which I don't have right, right on me. I think there's one behind me just there. Uh, so we'll get a free uh, limited edition exclusive lunch money mug uh, to whoever asks the, the best question whilst we are live. Now, I'm going to start off by introducing Peter McAtamony. Hello, Hello, Peter, how are you? Yeah, I'm excellent. Thank you. Fantastic. Peter McAtamony is the uh, is the principal of Wine Business Solutions. You've been a guest before. You made a wonderful suggestion last time that nobody took you up on, which was that uh, uh, we should have like a door-to-door uh, food from, from the airline foods. So, oh, you, know, yeah. you, could, you could order chicken or veg, and uh, I thought that was a, that was a great idea uh, during lockdown, but uh, I, didn't, I didn't see it come to fruition. Uh, no. It must be, uh, oh, I don't know, it must be five or six months since we last had you on. What's been keeping you busy of late? Yeah, well, it's been really interesting. I mean, uh, when we started, I thought, well, I really need to do a webinar, and I really need to do it right now, and it needs to be free, and it needs to go out fast. So the first thing I need to do was dig into my notes because at one stage I, I was running the turnaround management education program. So I thought it will be really interesting to see how all this is relevant and how it works um, because we've not just got one business in a crisis, we've got every business in a crisis and even the word crisis is not appropriate because it's not a fire, flood or earthquake where there's a playbook, it's a completely novel set of circumstances. And it was really interesting because, you know, the first stuff that I looked at, like putting your own mask on first and, you know, unsubscribing to things that are peripheral and having a chat to your bank about maybe refinancing, and that, that was all, of course, highly applicable and very good. The next stuff about stopping the bleeding, i.e. not paying people, you know, standard issue when you're trying to ring fence a business that's in trouble obviously didn't work at all in that there's an old saying in the wine industry that there's only one check and if anybody holds on to it, then we're all buggered. Um, right. And uh, it, it was really nice because um, one of my clients um, owed me a lot of money, the most money one individual client had owed me for some time. And, uh, you know, he paid up straight away, right in the moment when things looked darkest. And I thought, wow, that's, um, you know, that's a good thing. And everybody looked after everybody extremely well and they needed to. 
Um, but the last piece I found invaluable, and that was the stuff around the psychology. You know, what happens to people when they're under stress? How does it decision making get compromised? How do people believe things are worse than what they are? And what sort of behaviours do they exhibit as a consequence? And this is really interesting because every time I phoned somebody or talked to somebody, I couldn't um, anticipate what their response was going to be. I went down to the local Botlo and I said, how's it going? And he said, oh, you know, October was a bit slow, but then we kind of picked up in December and I said, so you haven't noticed that Australia is on fire and uh, we're staring at a global economic abyss um, short of massive stimulus and <laughs> he just hadn't noticed versus... I phoned up this distributor and, you know, I was sort of joking with him that he hadn't bought my research this year and he, he said, well, look, Peter, you know, it might be a little bit more serious than you think. I've just laid off 80% of my staff this morning. Wow. What, what sort of business was that? A distribution business. Right. So this is this is before JobKeeper. But I think the most, most telling one was I phoned the CEO of one of the biggest wineries in New South Wales. And I was expecting he'd say to me, well, Peter, we're just wrapping up this is the cellar door can't open, of course. Um, so I've sent the girls home and, you know, told them to, um, you know, get really busy with um, working direct channels, you know, phoning and emailing our customer base. Um, and, um, you know, because I've got a reasonable sort of um, supermarket business, we're probably going to be okay. But that's not what he said. He said, well, look, we're down to a third of a winemaker a third of a, a viticulturalist. Um, I've seen all the other staff home. I'm about to fire myself, take the kids out of private school, go home and hide under the doona. Wow. And uh, I, I said, well, why is that? And he said, well, I've, I've been hearing that the only wine that's selling is, you know, like two-litre cask. And I said, well, look, just, just hold up a minute here. I don't think that middle-class people are going to stop buying wine, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, no, it, it, it has just been extraordinary because, um, you know, I was at a barbecue the other night and I said something that I regretted afterwards, you know, I thought, well, I didn't really know this person and I shouldn't have been, you know, so controversial. But he said, look, you know, there's $42 billion that Australians spent overseas last year and now they're going to spend it all here. And I sort of chimed in without thinking and said, well, look, you know, the, the Chinese spent $60 billion here last year alone. Um, you know, it doesn't quite work that way. But then I was walking home afterwards and I thought, well, hang on a minute. You know, Australians are not going to go down to Darling Harbour and buy a stuffed kangaroo and a boomerang. You know, no. <laughs> it's, 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 Australians, when they're let out, want something very specific. And um, as they're being let out, um, those wine businesses that are ready for that have never had it better. Um, it's been absolutely extraordinary. There's that same guy that I talked to that was sort of, you know, in that deepest moment of doubt, turned his mobile phone around to me um, the other night at dinner and says, have, have a look at this, and they'd taken 71000 bucks on a Saturday sort of thing. So. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, tell me something. Last last time we spoke, we talked about um, you know the the the, sw the flip to digital was was a big thing that uh, you Absolutely. were seeing. And as I say, that was uh, that was we're in episode thirty five now, and I think that was about thirty episodes ago. What what's yeah. the most common question you're getting from your clients just just in the last two or three weeks? Is there is there a common theme that people are asking you? Well, I think the thing is that they're all kind of getting it. It's just a question of who's moving the fastest. And, um, you know, this is where we, we do benchmarking across Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and we're, we're using historic US data. They unfortunately didn't do their benchmarking this year because they were a bit depressed about what was going on, funnily enough. But um, what's really interesting about that is that although um, – Australian businesses increased their direct sales by about 50%. Um, the South Africans increased by 700. Uh, and you might say, why was that? Well, in their case, um, the lockdown was so hard that they couldn't even take samples to the laboratory. Wow. They couldn't even move stock off the wharf. Um, and so it was either learn how to do digital and, and do it really well, do it really right. fast Hi. And so that was, you know, just amazing to see um, how far and how fast people could go, you know, if they really had to. So okay. um, every, everybody's coming to me and saying, well, how do you do this? But for most businesses, it's really simple. So, so, so going, going digital is still, uh, is still top of mind for a lot of these guys? Uh, absolutely. And it's yes. just getting better and stronger. But, 
you know, that that starts with um, building better business at the cellar door. That That's really the driver for, you know, the wine business because if it's just going online and having a shop, if you're just a square with a bottle in it and a number, you know, um, Dan Murphy's and others are a fair bit more sophisticated yeah. at doing that. We'll let you uh, have a glass of wine while we put you back in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the waiting room there and we'll introduce our next guest, Tony Sykes. G'day, Tony. Uh, Hello, Nick. Not too bad. The last time uh, you were just doing a diet, like a, a quick little uh, appearance. Um, but um, General Insurance Brokers of Australia, um, what, what's uh, what's keeping you busy the last week, Tony? Um, it was keeping us busy at the moment. Uh, are the renewals? Um, insurance companies are increasing the um, all the business renewals, whether it be property or liability. Um, yeah. yeah, and as brokers, it's it's our job to go to the market and, and try and get the best terms, but also just to let the client know what's happening. Um, to their particular industry and how the insurance company is um, is treating them at the moment. Last time we spoke, you you pointed out that uh, because obviously insurance companies have got all this cash from premiums and they invest that, and you were yep. saying because investment returns were so low, uh, this was making insurers, uh, you know, they're, they're putting up a few hurdles and making things a bit harder. How does that work exactly? Well, it's, look, investment income is is one area of of, um, of revenue for the insurance companies. Um, the other thing, of course, is is having a um, a good claims loss ratio, so they don't pay out too many claims compared to the premiums that they um, they collect. But when the interest rates are high, insurers uh, generally attract good attract good capital. Um, they get a good return on their investment, so therefore they can afford to probably um, buy a little bit more business, right? Um, the pre- there's not so much pressure on the premiums to perform as far as loss ratios are concerned. But right. at the moment. Right, the insurance companies need to make sure that every risk that they insure, right, is 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 positive. Right, it's, yeah. it's actually a good risk, um, good risk to the to, to, to the shareholders, um, and it's, it's it's adding to the bucket. So that so their core business has to be profitable. The, the side hustle isn't necessarily paying off so much. Correct. So as a result, we actually do see a lot more insurance companies saying, or a lot more renewals coming up saying, look. Thank you, but you know, and we know we've insured this risk for some time, but we've decided to come off risk. You know, based on our on our data, this is a category that we don't want to get involved in. Um, yeah, and probably a good example of that would be the uh, building certifiers. Right, the poor old building certifier we've relied mm-hmm. on for so many years, and they do a fantastic job. And you know, as the because of the problems that we're having with with the um, the building codes and the claddings, um, to to get a professional indemnity insurance for for a building certifier. Uh, who's probably never had a claim against them, um, it's almost impossible at this market at the moment. Um, or if it is possible, it's, it's got various exclusions in there relating to certain parts of the code, whether it be cladding or, or whatever the case may be. Right. Look, before we get to that, I wonder if you can help us out with um, around how fine print uh, could cost insurers $500 million. Now, yep. the last time uh, I had you on, I asked you about whether or not COVID was uh, a disaster event or whatever the legal terminology is, and you said that there were some court cases to come. Yeah, so, got released two days two days ago. The, um, there was a test case. Now, this is all about business insurance policies mm-hmm. that have got business interruption covers in there, yep. and there's a an extension under those that well, actually, there's an exclusion under the business interruption policy that basically ex- excludes a um, a notifiable disease or pandemic. Under the Quarantine Act, I think of 1908 or something, or o, yeah, 08 or 05. Now that act got changed, right, to the Biosecurity Act, um, and because the insurance companies or some of the insurance companies didn't update their policy wordings, technically, a pandemic such as COVID is going to trigger a, a gross profit claim under the business interruption business interruption section of the policy. Right. So we got a lot of insurers at the moment that's um, reassessing their situations. Um, you know, one major insurer has actually has had a, um, a trading hold on the, on their shares to assess their, their capital wow. requirements. Wow. Yeah. Um, it's a pretty can, big deal. Can pretty I ask you, deal. Tony? Uh, this is a bit of a uh, probably a bit of an unfair question because it's a little bit technical. But um, what about in the event of insolvency? Like, if there's an insolvency event that's arguably caused by the interruption, I mean. Uh, you know, should insolvency people be speaking to you about about the sort of those, those uh, sorts of claims? The, the, the insolvency side of things is the, the thing that triggers a, um, a business disruption claim is, is there needs to be an event that's happened that generally causes damage to property. 
right fire storm flood whatever the case might be but then there are also the, an extensions there that refer to denial of access to premises um yep. and right. you know um, and that that's where the pandemic thing comes into it so it, insolvency is isn't going to be triggered for a, a loss of gross profit claim it's really perceived to be a commercial risk okay um, yeah. all right well look, by way of segue back to peter i'll ask you um what what are you seeing out of the wine industry the biggest existential risk at the moment um across the whole industry is china but um you know, it sounds ridiculous to say, you know, when we've got fire, flood, famine, coronavirus, lockdowns, um, you know, uh, global markets being impacted, that the biggest threat is none of those things. Um, but it's really interesting how that sort of spread because Treasury Wine Estates is a large part of it. And then you go onto the Wine Australia website and you see there's 200 exporters, and you th- uh, sorry, 2,000 exporters and you think wow that must mean that uh, everyone um is shipping to china but in well, actual- we, we, we just flashed a headline up there uh, again from this week's papers uh that yeah. said taylor's wine uh, sweats on clare valley shipment to china so yeah, it's, yeah. it's obviously across the industry yeah well taylor's are a client and you know when you see those um aerial photos of those container ships sort of spinning around in um, shanghai harbor it's pretty disturbing and you know there's a limited number of businesses that will be impacted because over half of those 2000 are basically um chinese people who have done a little bit of business to get a permanent residency visa so it's been really interesting talking to the medium-sized companies which are i guess my biggest client group and they said well look we spend a lot of time you know drinking wine and uh, doing pr in china but we don't really have that much exposure um, right. So the group of companies that are at risk are probably 10 out of the, the top 20. And where's it worst going to land, I suppose? It'll be back on the growers. However, um, we were going into a situation of shortage, which was about to see some Australian right. producers do things that they shouldn't have been doing. And, you know, from sources on the ground, I've been hearing that they were already doing that. So that would have potentially been worse for Australia in the long term than, you know, having a bit of a a slowdown at the moment. Um, So, you know, we really don't know when China will decide that it's, you know, time to stop kicking us in the head. But, um, you know, we've got to assume that, um, you know, something will have to be worked out for Chinese New Year or there's going to be a massive um, impact on Australia, you know, not not just where wine is concerned, but, you know, (laughs) A lot of business. Yeah. And, uh, Tony, uh, so there, it, there's, it's easy for wine growers and winemakers to get cover. Uh, I mean, what are, what are the main categories of insurable risk as far as you're concerned? Oh, well, there's, it's, the industry actually caters pretty well for the, um, for the wine industry. Um, yeah. There's a, a separate design policy. You know, the main, the main category, which is, of course, is, is public products liability, um, yeah. product recall, uh, product contamination um, yeah. are the main areas. Um, you know that there's some major insurers out there that do a good job, have done so to, um, for, for a long period of time, and have invested a lot of a lot of time and energy in, in getting that right for them. Okay, um, we've got. Uh, yeah, go on. Yeah, probably one of the challenge challenge areas that, that's probably coming up is is regarding um, construction of, of some of the sheds and, and the, the, the the cooling rooms. Right. Um, yeah, with with, um, with you've got EPS um, construction involved. Um, insurers have been suffering a lot of claims regarding fire with EPS, so this is composite aluminium type construction. Right. Um, You've got uh, obviously South Australia's gone back into lockdown again, and we've got a headline here: South Australian COVID nineteen lockdown hits the Australian wine sector hard. Um, do you do much in South Australia, Peter? Yeah, we do. Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of those businesses are really reliant on um, local tourism, and of course, when that gets shut down, then it does get difficult. So the the businesses that are doing best are the ones that have got um, good databases on the East Coast and can still market them. And, of course, those people that are in retail, and retail, of course, is well up. Um, But, you know, um, on-premise is really starting to come back strongly in the Eastern Seaboard as well. So there's a lot of different channels that people in South Australia can potentially um, focus more on. But, um, you know, like every um, wine-producing region, 
uh, at the moment, um, the best business at the best margins was coming from people sort of busting out of the cities and going, you know, enjoying themselves on the weekend. So with that okay. sort of on the table, then, you know, got some ground to make up. Right. I was just going to say, with, with the Adelaide lockdown, you know, it's also an opportunity for confidence to come back in. So, you know, they, they seem to address it pretty quickly, um, right. you know, to, to sort of have a break point there for just the six days. You know, if they get through that six days, and, and just going back to what Peter was referring to before about, you know, the psychology and, and you know, the business confidence, you know, if, if they prove to get it right and you know, they succeed in, in, in locking it down and they come back out and the, the people in Adelaide and, and the wine society, or sorry, the wine industry um, is happy with what they've done, you know, I, I just see it being a catalyst for confidence and steaming ahead for 2021. Now, well, look, one, one area that you, you mentioned to me the other day, Tony, I was talking to you about credit insurance uh, yeah. and you said that, uh, you know, obviously cover is getting harder to get in, in that for credit insurance. Sure is. So at, at the moment, yeah, um, probably, yeah, QB, I'll mention QB, most people would know QBE, they're, they're major play in credit insurance, um, have been for many years. Um, the word is they're really not taking on any new clients at the moment. Um, yeah. And one thing that we've learned from from COVID is is repricing of risk. We just don't know where the next hit's going to come from. Um, certainly, with our heavy reliance on exports in with China, um, so the, the credit risk is certainly there. Um, mm. So it's really is only existing accounts that are, are, are being offered renewals for um, the trade credit insurance and a business with a strong balance sheet. So any business that's got a you know a medium. Um, balance sheet that's not looking all that strong or that's susceptible to to a hit um, at the moment the market's just not there for them well one one of the things uh, i mean in our business uh, obviously uh, given that we're um uh, g- given that we're um you know in the cash flow finance business here yeah. at Hermie, uh you know what we we we're, we're sort of uh, saying well early next year we're we're expecting to be very busy because you know as job keeper rolls back and as the insolvency moratoriums roll off uh, we think that cash flow is going to come a lot more under pressure and obviously yeah. you know that's opportunities for the likes of me and for our friends in rest- corporate restructuring uh the flip side of that is that you know a, a, you know a debtor's ledger is great you know it's, it's great that people are going to be wanting to to borrow against their debtor's ledgers but of course you know we're also concerned about uh, debtors defaulting you know yeah, um, yeah. you know if, if, as these things come off so um and and so obviously the, the the inability to get insurance cover or the difficulty there is an issue um, is that anything Peter that, that that concerns your clients do they ever talk about insuring their receivables or is it something that they turn their minds to? Uh, well, when I used to run a wine business, it was pretty much, you know, the most important thing. Um, but we were a public listed company and we had um, governance requirements and it wasn't something that everybody did. I remember one very wealthy guy um, standing up at a conference showing off, really, but he said, well, if you've got money, you don't do trade credit insurance. <laughs> but um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in terms of smoothing things out, it makes a huge amount of sense. And certainly, if anybody ever asks me about it, it's something I recommend. When we're wherever we're running our workshops, I recommend yeah. that people take out trade yeah. credit insurance because what we found with the trade credit insurers was was that they were better than Standard and Poor's and the ratings agencies and so forth. That they would actually listen to gossip. That's so, right. You know, they they would actually feed back to us when they thought somebody was dodgy that we were dealing with and we could get onto it before, you know, their dealing with us had um, shown itself to be not what we'd hoped it was going to be. So we really found that invaluable. Well, it's funny you say that because um, you know we 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 subscribe to uh, to a, to an insurance database, and you know we'll get inquiries from the insurers uh, uh, asking us about particular debtors that they know that we have uh, on our books, and you know when they're asking questions, they're obviously asking on behalf of someone else, and you're thinking, well, they might even give you a heads up. Um, so as you That's say, right. I think that I've always said that with the, with the credit insurance, it's not just the actual insurance; it is the intelligence as well. Tony, aside from aside from credit insurance, are there any other areas that that the insurers are, uh, are concerned about any other industries or types of cover? Just, just generally, from a, a risk management point of view, you know, um, in, at all levels, um, insurers are looking at past claims experience for a, um, for businesses, right? They're, and if they have had claims, they're looking at what did they do, what have they done to mitigate that from happening again, right? right so, right, you know, right. if you've got a business that's that's got a um, warehousing or storage, uh, manufacturing, and they're not demonstrating you know, a regular um, um, uh, maintenance of their 
the housekeeping. Um, if, if they're not engaging with their staff as far as work health and safety and taking that seriously, um, they, they might have a hard time getting getting insured. Um, right. Or, so you've or, got to be at least uh, getting insurance with a decent um, with a decent um, ex- excess. But just just getting back to the to the trade credit area. Um, yeah, and trade credit is one of those policies that you you don't you don't arrange you don't sit and forget it you don't arrange it and just let it let it come up for renewal again. It's a very very active policy, and I, I think the insurers in that in that area have actually done a good job. Even now, when the market's restricted, in providing feedback to the clients or to the industry um, as as to what their data is showing them. Um, one of one of the things that that, that, that insurers have got, and and moving forward, are going to be relying on is. Is is all the big data, all the the amount of data that they're getting um, to to make a, analysis of what's happening? Um, it's just amazing, and, and and I think from the, and I know I'm going off topic a little bit, but I, I think from the uh, the Royal Commission, one of the general insurers um, were had seen was well, this is a great opportunity for us to be a hell of a lot more transparent to our clients. Um, so you know, we we see more and more information coming out from the insurers. Um, as to what information that they have, and and what is a perceived risk that they see, and 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 just future trends in in various areas. Okay, Peter, you've uh, I've got in my hot hands here the wine paper number sixty one. Um, you've got a for your uh, your wine uh, client database. Uh, you put out a, a paper periodically. Just tell us in a nutshell, uh, just a little bit about that. I think as far as actual content goes, and it's probably not relevant to a lot of people, but I think that the principle of what I was able to do with that newsletter should be very interesting to a lot of service businesses because I thought, well, look, you know, if I'm going to get people to read the stuff that I write, what should it look like? And I actually looked at what um, people give me investment advice were doing. So rather than having a blog, which people generally don't read, or, you know, putting stuff out in social media, which is too short, and even magazine articles too short, I thought, well, I'll actually write this paper and I'll frame it and make it look like, you know, the sort of stuff that you would get from um, the investment advisory companies. And that proved to be the difference between having a business and not because I would say two-thirds of all the business that I get is from people that have passed that newsletter on to somebody else. Right. Um, so in terms of sort of a, a proof of sort of having some idea what you're supposed to be talking about, it, it's worked fantastically well. So that goes out to 7,500 people globally and, um, you know, you just never know who's going to turn up in terms of who reads it. But, um, right, so if I, if I pass this on to someone and then it ends up in an engagement for you, do I get a case of wine? Is that how it works? <laughs> um, you've, got here, you've got here, actually, it's, well, I was about to ask you about your top 10 tips uh, for mm. building wine business which you've got here but but you you've just said actually that's a very interesting approach I mean, a lot of our viewers uh you know with their finance brokers or accountants or lawyers they are in the professional services business and you said rather than doing a blog or, or whatever you've taken you've looked at what the investment community does and you've put out a paper in those terms like a, a stock tips and what's going on in the economy sort of thing but you've done it specifically for the wine industry is there anything else that particularly leaps out that you would uh, that you think that maybe is something that that's sort of transferable to professional services well, I think the other thing is that, you know, I, I really try and write from the heart and, and I write in, you know, first-person voice. So when people read my stuff, they know that it's me, that I'm not talking as they the representative of an organisation. I think people like Motley Fool are really good at that. Right. You know, they, they, have their, they have various people talking, but it's it's always, in you know, in, in very particular language. And I think that's really a part of their success story. That's interesting. Um, it's a little bit like Alan Kohler with his Eureka report. Now, I, I don't agree with a lot of what he says. I, I don't agree with his school of economics, but he writes in a very engaging way. As a smaller service business or even a larger one, I suppose, you, you've got a fair bit of license with that. But it was funny, I was talking to a guy who um, looked after social and consumer engagement uh, at Commonwealth Bank, and I was talking to them about these ideas, and he, and he said, well, if you've got a a, an email or a message or a newsletter like that from the Commonwealth Bank, then people might be a bit suspicious. Right. <laughs> there, are, yeah. there, are, there, yeah. there are limits to this. But I think as a, as a general rule, you know, for a smaller business, if, if they're hearing something and they're hearing it from the principal and they know that it's from the heart, then, you know, I, I, I think it can be a really good tool in terms of acquiring new business. Absolutely. And I think most of us are pretty... Um, in tune to sort of know when we're getting snowed over and when we, when it's a genuine 
um, advice that's coming forward. Um, mm. And, mm. and you know, we, we're sophisticated listeners enough to know, okay, not 110% of it's going to be correct, but it, um, but it's their view and, their, and everyone's entitled to their professional view. Um, well, I mean, look, if I may sort of blow my own trumpet for a little bit, I mean, the, the whole thing with this lunch money is, you know, you've, you've I don't think you, you could go back to 35 sorry episodes. Sorry to draw attention to that, Nick, but uh, you're right. Yeah, but, but I mean, we, have, we, haven't, we haven't done a pitch once, you know. It's all about yeah, uh, yeah. genuine sharing networks and sharing information, and uh, yeah. I think that's, that's important. Look, I just thought that um, because you're not insolvency, guys, uh, I do have some headlines that I'd like to run through to see what you think, to get your, your perspectives. And I'm going to start off with uh, the economy poised for rapid rebound. Are you buying that, Peter? Oh, totally. And, you know, the, the thing that I'm always pushing to clients is that we're very, very good at um, envisaging how black things can be and quite often quite poor at envisaging how good they can be. And, you know, you've really got to think that regardless of what is happening or may happening, the US election or the vaccine or whatever, Australians, middle-class Australians, are sitting on more cash than we ever have in history. We're sitting on a pile of savings. And um, no one's talking about it. No one's talking about the fact that you can't buy a yacht or a new luxury car at the moment. But mm. that's actually what's happening. We've got no a few one's talking about it because they're embarrassed to talk about it. <laughs> it's <laughs> our next door car. So, well, let's just go to the next one. I guess that's interesting. So we've, ba we've basically... There is this question about whether or not there's even going to be a cliff. Now, my, my view is that we're living in a bit of a fool's paradise at the moment that we don't know. The, uh, then we've got savings war chest uh, will avoid fiscal cliff, CBA predicts. Um, oh, okay. And uh, that's a little bit about what you've just been saying, Peter, that people have got all these government payments and they've actually been paying debt off. Um, yeah. and there's, a, there's a chart that I don't have right now that it's a, one of Martin North's favourite charts where he shows... Um, uh, I think he calls it uh, t money supply. I can't remember the term that he uses, but money supply is tracking upwards. But credit, com uh, business credit is, is tracking downwards. Um, so I guess there is some robustness in the system. Yeah. I think, yeah. I, yeah, I think also, Nick, that, you know, the, the, the comment there was for rapid um, um, growth. I don't think it's going to be a rapid rebound. I think there will be a rebound. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, with, with my 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 clients are mainly SME clients, and they, they tend to be very optimistic in their nature anyway. Well, you have to be, don't you? Um, so that's good to see. But also, I think we're going to find people are finding new ways to do things. Yeah, you know, I've, I've been amazed and, and proud of, of of a number of my clients have just found new ways to do things. And you know, when they when they can't open up their office or they can't open up their shop or whatever they might be, um, yeah, I've got a travel agent who has like the business was decimated. Right, right. Um, yeah, but she still she has still worked hard. Her and her team has still worked hard to to make the best of what they've got. So they're setting up staycations, whether it be right. you know the best hotels in Sydney or Brisbane, where it might be, um, and and also building the network. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's very important as well. Uh, Virgin has a new uh, CEO, Hard Lichka, uh, makes a value pitch for Virgin two point um, I think they're going to keep. Some of their premium offering. There was some talk that they were going to go totally budget there at one stage, um, and obviously it looks like that, that. There's also their Virgin Alliance Regional Flights Partnership gets the green light. Um, I know that Peter. Obviously, you've got a very strong marketing background. I mean, have you got two bobs worth about uh, what's the, the, the Virgin's new direction? Yeah, not really. I mean, you know, I, I thought where they were before was a, a really bad place because I think everybody that sort of flew with Virgin, apart from some people that were hardcore loyalists, were finding that they were, you know, Qantas prices with Jetstar service sort of thing. So uh, they really needed to evaluate, reevaluate, I think. So it'll be interesting to see where they land. Um, but initially, it's just going to be. Um, you know, who can cover the opportunities best and fastest, I think. Because well, it literally they, come from Jetstar. So, you know, people thought that was a signal as to where it would go. Um, no. But uh, I must say, next week we've got one of the administrators of Virgin on as, as a guest. So uh, this one is interesting. Now, it was just announced this morning that Grocon has gone into administration. So I don't know whether or not that is the first of an avalanche. Now, obviously, Grocon is a large construction business. They were involved... Um, down at Barangaroo. Uh, were you aware of that, Tony? Had you heard that? No, I wasn't. So the, I'm, I, I deal more with construction at the um, medium-sized businesses and yeah. um, on the retail contract side. And 
from what I can see, they, they've got so much work at them that they're finding it hard to keep up, especially on the prestige end. Um, and and yeah. their challenge is, is home warranty insurance. And, and with, with this happening now this morning, you know, I, I, I can see that it's, it's going to be a big amount to try and climb over. Yeah, well, the trouble is that if you're, and again, I don't know who's exposed. I don't even know who the administrator is. I was trying to find which firm had that job and we were mm -hmm. eagerly Googling and I can't even find that out. But And I don't know, as I say, if there's a whole bunch of subcontractors that have got exposure, um, then there's a question of uh, if they're going to get paid and how much they're going to get paid, and that does have a knock-on effect. I appreciate that the that the construction sector, a lot of the, particularly down at the, the smaller subby level, they have got a lot of work on. Um, yeah. Guys, we are out of time, so I'm just going to ask you just for any final thoughts or comments. I'll start with you, Peter. Oh well, I think you know it. It, it always is about um, being optimistic, stay optimistic. Um, you know, it, it's interesting all the research around how optimistic investors tend to do better than pe pessimistic ones. But yeah, it, it's it's just been so encouraging to see what's happened in our sector, at least. You know that uh, having faith in our country, our government, our systems, uh, you know the the politicians to do the right thing. Um, is really paying dividends. You know, the example that Victoria set, the example that South Australia is looking to set, um, I think give people a lot of faith that uh, we're in a pretty good place compared to just about everywhere else around the world at the moment. What about yourself, Tony? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic as well, but I'm, I'm also just a little bit worried about the, you know, the, um, the job keeper coming off, um, what that's going to look like, you know, around about March next year. Um, you know, whilst I, I, you know, I'm a little worried about it, certain individual families um, that you know actually did are doing it tough. You know, um, did lose the job, um, and how they how are we going to go come through as an economy to to, to support that? Um, but yeah, no, I, I think we'll, 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 a vaccine is going to come. I, I sense that's going to be here soon, and, and that's going to have a lot. Um, that's going to be going to be the injection we need, so to speak. <laughs> Listen, just, 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 I just noticed we've got a question here, and I'll just throw it very quickly to you because we, we are out of time, Tony. But just, just there's a, there's a, there's a query here about um, a lot of a lot of businesses are being just kept afloat by JobKeeper. I mean, do you think that that would apply a lot to professional services firms? No, you don't think so. No, no the professional services, you know, the, the good ones of, um, yeah, you know, the, not too many that I know, especially in my industry. Um, um, are struggling. I mean, they've they've got good networks. They they can operate in the other side of the moon if they need to, um, and they've spent time on um, getting their compliance right. Okay, I've got some breaking news here from Suzanne Bell. Uh, she says that the information that was given to the South Australian government was incorrect, and lockdown won't be for six days. But I don't know. That's breaking news apparently. But I don't know if that means it's going to be longer than six days or less than six days. Guys, we're going to wrap it up there. I'm going to say thank you very much to you both for coming along. Uh, to Peter Major Tony from Wine Business Solutions and to Tony Sykes from uh, General Insurance Brokers of Australia. Thank you very much to our viewers and uh, look forward to doing it all again next week. Cheers. Good on you, Nick. Cheers, Thank man. you. Cheers. Bye for now.